live. Don't worry about us, chat. We are live. I know where the folder is. I know how to hit the go live button. I know what we're doing here. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the morning show, Stock Market TV. Spencer, JC, Straza back in action this week. We got the full cast and crew in the house, ready to go. Uh, today's guest, Ed Clissold from Ned Davis Research, will be on at 9. And then Ian Cully who runs uh, the FIC desk at All-Star Charts, will be on at 9.30. Uh, we got a lot to discuss. We have some adjustments to the S&P 500 going on. Uh, we got to talk some crypto, obviously. Uh, hey, Japan Nikkei, 40,000. Ah, looking good. We'll see what's on JC and Steve's mind. Where's my intro? Let's go. Hey now, welcome back, Mr. Straza. Looking good, buddy. He's looking hey refreshed. Guys. Looking refreshed, Steve. Looking refreshed. Like, not for nothing. I know, like, I'm usually breaking balls around here. You actually really do look good, though. <laughs> I mean, a week off from the camera was uh I missed you guys. I missed the shows, but it's nice. It's a nice break, you know. Listen, I don't want to make your head any bigger, but the chat did miss you. We got it was it was consistent commenting. Yeah. Were you guys just lying, or did you guys no, no. actually mess up? You Jason, guys, needs, you know I mean? Jason needs a foil. Jason needs a foil. Steve is a better foil than I. So Jason what does that mean, that. a foil? What does that mean? An opposite. An opposite? Are Steve yeah. really opposite? Uh, in some ways. In other we ways, agree no. on 99.9% .9 of things in life. Uh, not just not, in the market, uh, but in uh, life. Uh, like a, foil, a foil is an adversary. That's what it is. It's an adversary, I think. People like it when you, you and I disagree on like that 0.1% of life sometimes that we disagree on. Like Straza uh, doesn't like rice, for example, which I'm Cuban. So that's like against my religion. You know, that's right. They, no, they love it. Um, and we have a good time doing it, too, I think. Also, I mean, pe people like you when you're making money, right? Uh, it's a bull market. We're buying the riskiest assets. And I think that might have a little to do with uh, the chat love. Last time you were on uh you haven't been on since that bull market party that we had the other day uh yeah. was it a bull market party was that the kind of party you go to in bear markets uh i had such a nice time in new york it was was, it, was it a bull market dinner afterwards or no definitely it was a bull yeah. market uh family style dinner at right. what was it tony de whatever what was that place? tony denapolis tony denapolis i yeah, haven't been in that place in a minute dude the best part about the dinner was i was sitting with batnick chatting it up and he was very anxious about his interview that was coming up with Eli Manning. Because we're both like huge Giants fans. Yep. And just getting to like brainstorm that out with him for like 30 minutes over dinner. I was didn't even cool. know. You knew. So obviously you knew. I didn't know. I didn't he know until he right. told me. And I was just like, you're what? <laughs> Hold on. Can we just talk about for a second? I spoke to Batnick, I think on Friday. Can yeah. we just talk about how he introduced Archie Manning as the stockbroker? <laughs> Come on. I literally, I, I, I honestly, seriously almost pee my pants laughing so hard. You're like, you know, uh, your father, he was a stockbroker. I'm like, are you kidding me? And then Eli called him out. He's like, wow, that is the first time my father has ever been introduced. So for those who don't know, so uh, Michael Batnick over in the Compound and Friends, partners with Josh Brown and Barry Ritholtz, uh, they had Eli Manning on the show. Eli Manning apparently is in private equity now, which was something I also learned. That was cool. Yep. And, um, you know, talking about how he's like a rookie uh, in, in the business world now that was was fascinating. Um, but the fact that Michael Batnick going over like his resume, you know, talked about how his father was a stockbroker. Meanwhile, Archie Manning is, you know, a legendary quarterback. And by the way, Eli Manning has probably had to listen to his father get introduced. Like, yeah. I don't know, a times. zillion times over his whole life, life. Yeah. his whole life. So the fact that Batnick introduces his father as a stockbroker. So, yeah, so he gave a lot of time and thought uh, to, to the intro. He was worried that he was going to cry. I, that must be, like, the most surreal moment. I don't think there's another. I almost cry. cried, you know, knowing Batnick as well as I do for so many years. Like, that was, you know, that was, you know, he's like, I feel like I'm reading my wedding vows. <laughs> Anyways, I love those guys. They're, they're, they're just the best, like, absolutely killing it over there, yet, like, still humble about it. Uh, just so cool to hang out with. Love seeing you, Morgan, everybody else for your birthday. And then I had a week off. Played a lot of golf, so if I'm glowing, it's the golf course does that to me. You're a little, honestly, I was gonna say you're a little pale. 
Not that I'm anyone to talk. I mean, look at this face. Jesus. Only played once over the weekend, and it's been shit here. Overcast. Not much sun. No. I wanted to save it. I wanted to save it for recess, but I have, listen to this. We'll get into the market now. I have a private investigator from the California Department of Agriculture. Stop. Chate, I swear Wine. to God. Hounding me down because we didn't properly file our custom crush in uh, in September. We have to like detail like how many tons and the thing and like somebody along. I don't know if it was me or my attorneys or my partner. Somebody screwed it up. I have the California Department of Agriculture hounding me about my crush, which, by the way, it was only like four point eight tons. Like it's not that much. It's like 230, 240 cases worth of juice. It's not that big of a deal. So but what 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 did you do wrong? Like trigger the. I don't know. I'm gonna find out later this afternoon. We don't know. <laughs> I have no, to respond to the private investigator by uh, by by March 4th. It's a true story. So this is Department of Agriculture That's today, JC. U.S. Government. Department of California Department of yeah. Agriculture. Okay, because this is a kind of a funky, unique situation, like what what you you've gotten yourself into here with this wine, because you you're you're operating in an industry where you have to operate within a certain state's border. But they're texting me. They're like texting me. Look at this. This is the um, special investigator from the CDFA market enforcement branch regarding my 2023 grape crush. How about that? I feel so I don't know, important. Man. If, if, like, a if a government agency texted me, I would, I would report as spam. Um, well, I emailed my attorneys and they're like, oh, yeah. I'm like, is this real? <laughs> uh, right. You're very brave to deal with with this communist state the way you are you know don't say bad things about california listen nothing's perfect it's a beautiful listen. state hit the hit the bumper let's talk about the market yeah oh, please boy. all right how do we you know we always start with the dow right don't fight papa dow you, yeah pop when i switch it up and start with the bitcoin yeah, oh, you better oh. start with the Bitcoin today. Is that is that an indicator? Is that, that a contrarian indicator? That's, to today? that's toppy top, behavior. That's toppy top behavior. behavior. Not gonna lie, toppy behavior. Yeah. Uh, so so Bitcoin. Hold on. So Bitcoin uh, up twenty five hundred dollars this morning for those keeping score at home uh, on the Bitcoin four percent. That's sixty five thousand six hundred uh, on Bitcoin. Ethereum hanging in there above thirty five hundred, up about one percent on the day. And you got the old Solana hanging in there nice, right around 132, up 1.7% on the day. Crypto market cap, Spencer's blown away every time I say this. Spencer, 2.37 trillion uh, on the total crypto market cap. How about that, huh? It was 2 trillion, like, what, a week and a half ago? Like a week and a half ago, basically, <laughs> yep. Uh, all right, so Dow futures down 160 points, about 40 basis points. S&P futures there at eight handles, about 16 basis points. NASDAQ futures flat. 30-year bond futures uh, down a whole bunch, 60 basis points. Uh, silver flat, gold flat, oil flat, copper flat, dollar flat. Uh, volatility up a little bit, up to 13 and a half on the VIX. U.S. 10-year yield hanging in there, 4.22% um, uh, on yields. And uh, Caleb Franson in the house. Shout out, Caleb. Um this Bitcoin, Straza, listen, the way that I learned it was the bigger the base, the higher in space. And, and rest yeah. in peace, Mr. Alan Shaw recently passed away. That was his quote. And my understanding is he learned from his predecessors. But I got a new one. This one's coming from Market Sleuth. Uh, this is John at Market Sleuth. The bigger the base, the bigger it rips in your face. Oh, I like that. <laughs> that was funny, I thought, no? Yeah, it's pretty good. That's pretty good. I, uh, I, I retweeted that guy, right? Shout out. Shout out to, uh, what's this guy's name? Shout out, at Market Sleuth. What's the takeaway here, though, from this chart, right? We've been talking about this level forever. We're here. Now we're here. what? I'm not selling my Bitcoin. I want to know what you're doing. Um, I'm out. Um, Why? Tactically, I'm out. I have I have positions that I'm not touching. You know that. I get it. Yeah, and and, and right. I'm gonna and I'm gonna talk about this. I'm gonna I'm gonna do a blog post about sort of like where my, um, you know, my personal holdings because I think it's really important for people to understand where somebody is coming from and from what perspective they're coming from when they're saying things and saying market commentary. I just don't want it to come off as like douchey. You know what I mean? 
Like, how do you feel about that, Spencer? Do you think it's douchey to sort of like lay out like how much money I have, like in different things, or or is that like valid? Is that like real? Keeping it real. I think you don't need to talk about how much money you have on the line, but it's not douchey to talk about your positions, right? So you think I should keep it to positions and not the money? What do you think? No, I think I think you use percentages because that is important. People do care about that. Right. And clients continue to ask. Great idea. That's yeah, you a, make that's it percentages, a... but you yeah, give some sort of ballpark idea, yeah. right? Of yeah. the absolute number, people are interested. In, people are interested in the allocation. The allocation is really, yeah. really is, that's really what matters. But it, yes, and it's also important though. It's, it's like a, like a tax bracket. As you get higher up there, you should make different decisions in a way. Well, that's the whole right? thing, like, right? Like, All, when so, All Star Charge All Star Charge started in 2010, how old was I in 2010? I was 28. I I I'm a I am night and day different in terms yeah. of my perspective on markets, my perspective on life. I was just a, a young kid trying to figure it out. I got yeah. three kids, you know, homeowner, yeah. you know, all, all these things, right? I'm a, just a, a I don't want to say I'm a different person, but I certainly yeah. approach the market from a way different perspective. I'm not Ooh. I'm not trading I'm not trading natural gas inventories, just day like trading that. natural gas inventories like I was, you know. It's just different. It's a different perspective. So I, I got a blog post I'm working on. Um, I'm, I got a blog post I'm working on. I think there's a right way to do it. And I think that would be a huge, huge, you know, very valuable post uh, for people. And I, I want to also talk about how sort of my perspective has changed over the years as well. Right. I'll, I'll also say you don't have to do it. It's something that most people wouldn't do. So kudos to you if you do do it. Um, I wouldn't expect that. You know what I mean? You know, I, I've kind of kept I, I keep things close to the close to the heart, um, you know, because it's nobody's business. But I do think that it will it will it will help give perspective. So what so tactically, right? Forget about longer term positions. Tactically target hit. Target hit, right? Flip the book long above 31. You know, that was the trade. Target back to the highs. Mission accomplished, right? Here we are. Big ups to, you know, Louis, Straza. All-Star Charge team, you know, Spencer been pounding the table on the Dogecoin this whole time, right? Shout out, shout out to Spencer. You know, listen, it was a good trade. I mean, there were people who, I mean, literally took me seriously when I said mortgage the house on a breakout above 31. You know, I know some people have reached out and said, JC, you know, um, kudos, kudos to everybody who participated in that. Uh, kudos to anybody who was willing to take enough risk to buy these cryptos and some of these shittier cryptos in an environment where a lot of people were telling you that's a crazy thing to do. I had our intern, one of our interns, won't name any names, uh, ping me, I think it was Friday or Saturday, he was probably reviewing his account uh, allocation. He said, do you own any Dogecoin? I feel like I just own way too much Dogecoin. Like, is this uh, Nice. And I said, you know what? Speaking of, that's the top. In this environment, probably not. So you're probably doing actually the perfect, you know, the right thing uh, by owning the shittiest ones uh, in this kind of a tape. So... You know, kudos to anybody who who took the risk. And, and well, that's and, the thing about the thing about rising markets is if you do nothing, your allocation will increase. <laughs> so, well, isn't that what happened? Yeah. Isn't that what happened with uh, with Warren Buffett and Apple or something like that, yeah. Spencer? Yeah. yeah. It's, so he, I don't know if you're yeah. keeping score at home, Mr. Spencer Israel, but your your Dogecoin is at twenty three billion dollars in market capitalization. How does that make you feel? Twenty three I... billion. Yeah. Dude, I know that's you a know weird what? one for me. That's always kind of been a tough one for me. You know I what? It's, it's a Bitcoin fork. It's a Bitcoin yeah. fork. I I prefer spoons uh, or sporks. Uh, Yasuo oh. wants to know if uh, JC short Apple. Well, I got puts in Apple, so I'm I'm in. Uh, I'm in. I'm I, I'm not uh, I don't, I'm not short the equity. I want the leverage. Dude, uh, the, yeah, yes, I'm in. This Robin Hood just won't stop. Like this is trading like a crypto stock now, but the, the reason I just pulled it up, it's is been this, trading like I guess maybe I shouldn't say that. I, I'll take that back. I take because it's not trading like some of the miners. I take that back. It's just been mooning the past few weeks. It's, it's kind of like it's getting on board with the rest of these crypto equities. The base looks great. This is a thirteen billion dollar company. You just said Dogecoin is ten billion dollars larger than Robinhood. That's wild. Isn't it hysterical? It's really crazy. Yeah. Isn't that funny? I think, yeah. Uh, how, if you're not, how if you're not having fun in this market. Uh, Robinhood, fourteen billion. Dogecoin, twenty three. How are you doing? <laughs> you know, so um, let's move here. Let's talk about like how do we make money between now and a certain time, shortly in the future, right? Probably takes a month or two. I'm looking at this Ethereum chart. 
I know oh, I was going to say oh, short oh, apple. The, the short apple long Bitcoin trade keeps working. Sure. Anybody got that one on? I guess technically I do. No. Uh, see, Apple, that, what's what's going on? What's dragging it lower? Short Tim Cook, what's long Michael Saylor. You, wait, <laughs> you want to you, you know the headline this morning? Yeah, Steve? what's the Apple news that's moving the stock right now? Because this, uh, e- this has got some volume. The, the, the EU is coming to play. Again, they, they do this from time to time. Uh, yeah. EU fined Apple 1.8 billion euros. That's $1.95 billion. Uh, it's an antitrust fine as it pertains to uh, the the like Apple's distribution of music and streaming apps. Uh, what yeah. the EU said, or sorry, European Commission. Yeah, yeah, EU, same thing. Uh, yeah. And what they what they said was that Apple had uh, made these restrictions on developers that prevented the developers from telling iPhone users about other music streaming apps, mainly Spotify. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about Spotify, right? Um, and so the EU, EU says no bueno. So uh, two, about $2 billion fine. Okay. Apple, you know, okay, so. Europe. You know what? The, th- the yeah. thing about Europe that's funny uh, is it went from being like the largest, most economically important, um, you know, sector of the world to just not really even being material at all anymore. Right. And, hate, and yeah, Apple's response to this. Europe? European what? stocks are outperforming the U.S. stocks. I'm just saying like th- them as an economic region of the world, they are just like mm, barely material to most companies at this yeah. point. Yeah. And also Apple's response is, oh, we don't care. You know, this happens to benefit Spotify, which is based where? Europe. Um, yeah. Also, you know, there's a lot has been made of. Spotify think, is based in Europe? Yes. Yeah, Switzerland? Swedish. Swedish. Um, really? a, a lot has been made of the Luxembourg. Apple. Apple. No, it's Sweden. Well, maybe whatever. Doesn't matter. Luxembourg um, City. Uh, at the fact that the App Store takes a thirty percent cut. Apple takes thirty percent cut of because all purchases made through the App Store. But like, if you invented the store, should you not take a cut of the store that you invented? Oh, dude. right. Listen, <laughs> they, they deserved it. They got there. That that's the part of building a monopoly. Right, he yeah, basically, he basically yeah. to get there. Like, yeah, yeah, that's why we're building a monopoly here. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's good business running running shit. You know. Yeah. Let me say one thing about Apple, and then let's move on. Uh, the chart does look what, vulnerable, not great. Uh, so I get it. I get why JC short the relative. Putting it, that's putting it nicely. Listen though, this AI stuff. Oh, here we go. You think it's not going to touch Apple? They don't need to be at. The forefront. Are we? The- are we? Pre- hold on. Are we pretending that you and I know anything about AI? Is you don't that what we're doing to. here. This is. You know how I like to think about these things, like dumb brain, dumb brain style. Okay. Apple, your iPhone. Everybody uses it all day, every day. It's the most important device in any human's life. Okay. The upgrade cycle that people love to complain about how bad it is. No new fe- features. No new this. We're about to all have iPhones on steroids. Can you imagine like the new cool stuff that Apple's about to deliver? I know people that were on steroids. I know people that were on steroids. That's no good. Your iPhone is about to be on steroids. Yeah, I'm telling you. You're going to juice these things. I played baseball. I played baseball in the 90s. All right. Well, I guess my point is this is this is their big seller. This is their big revenue uh, segment. For the first time in a long time, I think people might go buy an iPhone, even if they don't need a new iPhone. Like this, no, people people do that. Any, people do that anyway, Steve. Yeah, people do that anyway. Not me. I don't. I literally wait for okay. me to either lose it or break it, and then I get one. Ah, I'm talking about the vast majority of people. How many people are actually going out there? Like, oh, the new iPhone came out. There's nothing new or cool about it, but I'm going to go get it. Or how many people find any of these like late like, latest I, features? I think, like, I, think oh, I think they. I think, think they all have something new and cool, like by definition. I guess the point I'm making is, if you think the features that they've added over the past few years are new and cool. Just, just wait for the next year, two, three. Yeah. Years. They're gonna. What do does that have to do with my sh- with my, my puts that expire in June? Listen, this company doesn't need much to get people excited. I, I think the narrative about them has been pretty bad. Like they're losing AI. I think they're going to be one of the biggest beneficiaries of AI. I like hope the they are. What does that have to do with my short? Well, well JC, ah, JC, I'll tell you what. This both is. be true. That would both right. be the right, right move. JC, we, we talked last week about the like bearish headlines on Apple that don't actually mean any, anything, like Warren Buffett selling, the yeah. death of the Apple car. This is another one. This is another Apple bearish card. headline. Did you even know, Straza? Hold on, time out. Did you even know that they had an Apple card? Car. An Apple car? Yeah, it's uh, Goldman Sachs, and Goldman, I think, just got out of it. No, no, no. No, a car. No, 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 no. A car. car, car, car. Like automobile. A car, not card. Automobile. 
No. See, Strauss didn't even know, and he reads the news. Okay, don't want that. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, but th th this is this is Strauss my point. Is like, whoa, whoa, whoa! That changes everything. I'm I'm gonna be short with JC now. All I know about Apple is they just need to figure out how to continue to own our eyeballs after the iPhone has been surpassed, right? Whatever the new iPhone is, if right. they're making it, holy shit. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly. all they need to do, and that's all they're focused on doing because they're very smart. This company, shout out Tim Cook. We talk about all these great CEOs and executives. Tim Cook, one of the best ever. He's done so well. So. The, the long Michael Saylor short Tim Cook trade continues to, uh, continues to work here. You want to punch it up? I want to run the earnings bumper because I need to go jack my AC down a little bit before I start sweating like I'm in a sauna. And then I want to talk about the C-limited uh, earnings. All right, quickly. Um, by the way, got... we have Ed Clissold coming up. That's great. Can yes, we throw up uh, Can we throw up this slide here? JC, no, one, Taylor, no one is making this trade besides you. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Just, just, just because there is a... One stock is beating another stock. Does, does does not make a trade there, right? What do you guys take? You think this is a good chart? This is, I thought this was a good chart. No? Oh my goodness gracious! Surely you can find better looking charts than this because that because Apple is still Apple. You can why not go MicroStrategy versus GameStop? I mean, it probably looks amazing. I don't know. Does it? I haven't looked at GameStop lately. I don't know. <laughs> Just, what? Yeah. We, we we can play this game all day, JC. I don't know why you need to pick like uh, this. This is silly. I'm not sure at GameStop. First of all, GameStop's a $4 billion company. Um, I probably still have crazy short interest. I don't even know. I'm not going to touch this thing. Apple's $3 trillion, bro, and, and making new relative lows every day. Every day, making new relative lows. Every day. Sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I'm not a disagreeing with your short-term tactical short call. I'm just saying this, this comparison is silly. It, it, it's just silly. Mike, well, should, yes. if you think it's silly, I might like it more. <laughs> Fine, go ahead and do it. No, no, and I'm not, making, not, I'm not saying you specifically, Spencer Israel, just your general opinion of its silliness, which I would probably agree with you. Like, I'm with you on that. But the fact that that thought that this is silly um, Whatever. probably gives it more validity. Okay. Whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, I agree. It's a little silly, right? <laughs> yeah, okay, fact, right. You think it's silly, too. Right, but I think that that is, I think that gives it validity. You know, the fact that you and I both think it's a little silly, eh, no. maybe it's not so silly. <laughs> that This cannot be your your, your barometer test. It, it, it cannot be. I don't know. <laughs> I don't can't. know. This is, this is okay. All right, why don't you hit that earnings bumper and well, tell me what I need to know. I'm By the way, Ed Clissold in the house. Very excited for Ed. He's the man. What uh, do we actually have any earnings today? Uh, let, me, let me look at the calendar. Um, let me. I have the calendar in here somewhere. It's a really. It's retail earnings week. I know that. Uh, where's my yeah, calendar? Yeah, C Limited is a giant oh, retail. Oh, I'm gonna throw it in there. My bad. I'll, I'll get that in there, Fonz. Okay, I'll throw the bumper up. Giant retailers has a thirty billion. Giant? It was like almost 200 billion at its peak. Was it? <laughs> was yeah. it really? Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah, this one's come come down a lot from wow. the private cycle highs. Holy and it's just God. just bottoming now. And I mean, the big bigger thing here, ugh, I have a chart. We probably don't have one ready. Um you put out a risk that, reversal on this one, right? We got a risk reversal on long calls. We've been long common. Um the old Texas hedge, huh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I don't even think like the like the base has not even broken out yet. One of the cool things about this. So let me got this little volume pocket chart here. I want to talk about these volume pockets, how they work, why they work, yada yada. Spencer, can you give us the headline? Oh, I mean, in the meantime, yeah. I'm just gonna chart. Sure. I mean, earn earnings per share, they lost 19 cents. Uh, versus a gain of 72 cents a year ago. Sales are rising a little bit, $3.62 billion. That came in a little bit above the estimates of $3.53 billion. They expect, let's see, uh, gross merchandise volume growth in the high teens. Uh, I guess their EBITDA outlook for the second half of the year was all right. I don't know. I haven't really seen what the stock is doing this morning. Uh, yeah, it's up 10 to 12%. All right, that's cool. They didn't need much um, for a beat here. Expectations were so low. This company has just been um, 
making investors very sad for for a while now. So it's one of those situations where just as long as it's not terrible, you probably get a positive reaction, which I love. Here's the chart. And the chart was just ripe and ready for it. You know, we talked about over the past few weeks, hey, look at the Philippines, you know, uh, making new 52-week highs. Look at China finding a bottom. Look at Southeast Asia kind of thawing out a little bit, starting to look a bit better. And you go and you look under the hood at some stuff like this. This is the largest consumer brand in Southeast Asia, I believe, by far. And it's taken out those pivot highs. You got this little volume pocket, right? So it's taken out um, its intraday gap high from the gap down uh, where the first red arrow is. Then you had some pivot highs from the fall there. It went up. We tested just late February. Blast through it and into the zone. Then earnings come around the corner, and they just act as the catalyst to where are we today? We're filling this gap. I believe we're above 55, right? So it took a week. Once we got in that zone, that little mem memory pocket, 57, four, 57, four 30, sections, of 12 quarter percent. Fill it. Right? So that's why we mark these charts up this way and we look for these kinds of chart patterns is because we want a quick move. It's also why we're in a risk reversal. We're, we're betting on that gap filling. We're betting on it filling you know, as fast as possible. We want to make as much money as we can uh, as that price action plays out. So this By the one, way, these volume pockets, dude. They work well. Yeah, man. Both directions, by the way. Hell yeah. Totally. Both directions, 100%. So anyway, I'm excited about this one. Uh, this is a name I think we're going to be talking a lot more about uh, over the coming years. They're, they're just getting started here, right? This is still not profitable growth, right? Um, when that turns, like we saw with Uber or DraftKings, or we're seeing now with Coinbase, when these companies turn the corner and they're growing revenues the way a company like uh, SE is, look out, right? Uh, tends to tends to be a train you want to hop aboard and trend you want to ride higher so all aboard right all Ed aboard today's guest ed clissold are we bringing him on chief you yeah chief you strategist nice. and then davis research he's here let's bring him on sweet Yo. jay we've make been friends for a long time make the call i mean this is pretty professional guys nice uh nice show you got going here oh. Mr. Ed Clissold in the house. How are you? Doing great. How are you guys doing? No complaints. It's a bull market. A lot of parties these days. Let me ask you this, Ed. You've been, you've been around quite a long time. The way I look at it is that bull markets are more fun than bear markets. I believe it was Marty Zweig who said that. The reason I think that, not because you can't make money in bear markets, the reason I think that is because the parties are better in bull markets and they're also more frequent. And... I have been noticing that the parties that I've been going to and been getting invited to lately are better than the ones we were going to two years ago, and they're happening a lot more frequently. How how do you feel about that? Yeah, well, look, mo most people are naturally long, right? And, and so they're 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 not gonna you know you you find the people who who do who do short stocks, but that's not most people. So yeah, so the rising tide is going to li lift all boats. That's probably the the biggest thing, and I think people naturally want to be optimistic they want things to be going well so so yeah yeah it's going to be uh you know it's a lot more fun uh to share in it and the other thing too is you know being being a short is usually a pretty lonely existence so it can be a party of one you know if you're going to be uh if you're if you're if you're short and right sometimes and, and, uh, and ed if 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 you're shorting and you're not lonely um, and there's a big crowd there, then it's something's probably, uh, something's probably changing soon. Yeah. And if you, I'll tell you an example, of that is what happened in the last year. Uh, you know, the Bloomberg surveys about 25 strategists and asked him, Hey, what's your target S and P target for the end of the year. And a few years ago, they asked me to be part of the group. I thought, ah, oh, okay. That's kind of cool. Kind of, you know, kind of stroke of my ego to, to be, to be in the group, but it's very interesting to watch how this transpires because e every month they email us and say, Hey, we're going to update our numbers in a week. So, you know, if you're, you know, let us know if you have any changes. So if you, for, so if you see a, a, a flurry of strategists updating their S and P targets, because Bloomberg reminded them to do it. <laughs> uh, nice. So Ooh. yeah, but um, I, I, I've seen a few actually. Yeah. So a few raises <laughs> lately. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah. and uh, uh, but um what what happened at the end of 2022 was it the, it became so one sided the other way because the consensus was oh recession's going to start early 23 
the lo- the market lows never have never occurred before the start of a recession. So they're go- we're going to break those October 2022 lows. The first time ever, this Bloomberg survey showed the median estimate was for the S&P to decline on the year. So everybody got on that on that side. And look, it, maybe if we had tumbled into recession, majority would have been right, but we, we, we didn't. And then you had this wall of worry for the market to climb. Uh, and then we're, I still think we're climbing it, even, even though finally, the, I, I think the strategists are are kind of getting getting on board. Um, I, I still think there's some lingering kind of, okay, we, we trust the market's going up, but we don't necessarily trust the reasons why we're not comfortable with it. Um, and, and so there's kind of lingering bears and out. And also, investors could stay optimistic for, for quite some time. Uh, newsletter writers are the most bullish they've been in years also. Uh, I, our, our mutual friend, Willie Delwich, likes to say... <laughs> That uh, in, in bull markets, you need bulls to be buying stocks. And, and you see that in bull markets quite a bit. It's it's when there's no bulls and way too many bears that the signals stand out a lot more to me. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah I, I think so. I think the sentiment probably it, it tends to work better on calling market bottoms and the market, top, market tops. And like, for example, right now, we have we have a few different sentiment composites we, we, we put together. One of them is kind of, we call it intermediate term, looking out you know, uh, maybe th- three months, maybe six months to the long end. And it's actually been uh, in an optimistic zone for about like 64 days, I think. And um, that's like the eighth longest ever. Okay, yeah, you got it up. So so yeah, so the, that orange line is, is that composite. So there's like seven different sentiment things and like put call ratios, like AAII, American Association of Individual Investors Survey, Consensus Inc. You know, those are the things yep. that are in there. And then that that one right below it, the light blue, that's the number of consecutive days that you've been in the optimistic zone. So yeah, we're kind of kind of getting up there, been there a while. But but to your point, you know, you can stay there for a long time. It, it's when it, it rolls over and then and the and the bulls start to get scared that that's when you know you can get some some nastier market conditions. I, I, I took a little peek at, at some of the charts you sent in here, so I'm really curious about this. So I'm not like Mr. Fed guy. Um, you know, I, I have a really hard time wrapping my head around what the market does with the Fed and what it doesn't do and the he said, she said. So I just ignore it altogether. It makes my brain hurt. But it, 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 it sounds to me like you probably have given this uh, some thought, and I did see some charts. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you're thinking about how the market reacts with the Fed cuts and the hikes. And, and Spencer, if you want to pull that chart up, I'd love to hear your thoughts here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what we do here is we, we take take an event. In this case, it's the first Fed rate cut. Uh, we say, what does the market do around that time? So that black line um, in the middle there, that's the S&P 500 on average around the start of all Fed easing cycles. So that first dash line on the left, that's the first first cut. So everything left of that is the year before the first cut. And then you go one year and two years later. But not all easing cycles are equal. Sometimes they go fairly slowly. They're cutting, say, four or fewer times in a given year. That's that blue line. Um, and then sometimes they, they go quickly. They're, they're having to cut a lot. And that's the orange line. So you think, okay, overall, the market does pretty well once the Fed starts to cut. They're adding liquidity. That tends to be good for risk assets like stocks. Fine. But maybe it's a little counterintuitive. You think, well, if the Fed's cutting a lot, that should be good. They're adding, they're putting more liquidity in the system. But then you have to ask yourself the question, why? Why would the Fed be cutting you know, five, six, seven times a year? And that's because they, they screwed up. And, and they've already, um, they, they, they're they probably, they probably entering a recession. And so the Fed's having to having to cut aggressively to try to combat that. Uh, and the orange line shows on average, you know, you, you do okay. But, but this is where the average is a little bit misleading because you're going to get a bear market on all probability. Just does that happen two months later? Does that happen twelve months later? You know, you don't know. And so, on average, it, it kind of smooths out the volatility. But you you do tend to get a bear market. Versus if it's a slow cycle, again, that's that blue line. The Fed can afford to go slowly. They cut a few times. You know, okay, you know, fine. They're, they're you know maybe they you know, real rates are a little bit high. They cut a few times. The economy is doing okay. They can afford to go slowly. And stocks tend to tend to really like that. Um, so we, we put a report out where you said, you know, D- dear Jay, uh, move slowly, love the bulls, uh, uh you know, our nice. little love letter to, yeah, to yeah, sell side strategist. We got to try to try to keep it somewhat interesting. Cute, Ed, it's cute. I like yeah, it. I'm into yeah. it. But, uh, but yeah, so, so the fed has been talking about moving slowly. The market was saying, no, 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 the fed's going to cut aggressively, cut aggressively. And I think that was kind of an implicit bearish call saying, oh, we're going to, you know, they're, they're going to 
that all this bad stuff's gonna happen. The Fed's gonna have to have to panic. And the Fed's been saying, we don't think we're gonna panic. And you know, we'll see what happens the next. I mean, you know, we could probably come up with a bunch of different reasons for for the economy to run into trouble and the Fed does panic. But if the Fed does what they say they're gonna do, it's actually pretty good. And you can look, I mean, just you know, you don't have to be a huge market historian to to think about it intuitively. Uh, like if you look back, you know, in, in 2001, the Fed cut aggressively, mild recession, but, you know, the dot-com bubble burst and all sorts of terrible things were happening. 2007, of course, got in the financial crisis, so they had to go all the way to zero. 2019, it didn't seem that way when they first cut in mid-19, but of course, we don't, you know, nine months later, uh, you know, the world shut down. Right. Uh, so those are the, yeah, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that happens. Contrast like 98. Okay, they cut a few times long-term capital management, but you know they kind of kind of worked out okay. Yeah, you know, at least for another year or so. Another year or so, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so you're saying that the Fed is is saying that they're going to do certain things. How trustworthy do you believe that they are when they say that? Is that you put a lot of validity on that, or we'll see? Yeah, we'll, we'll see. There, there are people too. Um, right. You know, economists are people. Uh, Fed officials are people. And they uh, there are susceptible to the same. The economists are people. I thought they were sheep. I, I <laughs> it feels that way sometimes now, doesn't it? Um, but I, although every economist I've talked to, at least they've appeared to be people. Um, you know, maybe they're uh, wolves in sheep clothing. I don't know. There's probably a joke in there. Warren somewhere. Buffett told me that any any company that employs an economist has one employee too many. That's what Warren Buffett said. I don't know you, nothing, you, but that's what he said. You wait till chat. You wait till chat GPT replaces the Economist. Then you'll really be upset, Jason. As long as they keep the magazine, right, Ed? What? Yeah. The economists can do what they want. Just keep. Make sure you got the that magazine. Keep them coming, baby. <laughs> yeah. Get yeah, get get those headlines. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Those cover stories. Yeah. I think. Uh, um, although, hey, you know, Google has an Economist. Is that one? Was that maybe that's a sign that yeah, there's still plenty more uh, cutting to do for this for mega cap tech, because their, their economists were saying that uh, productivity is being chronically um, uh, uh, undermeasured uh, because um, of all the you know all the, the the benefits from smartphones and and all those things. And maybe they're right about maybe maybe their economists is right. I don't know. The thing about Google is that they have a lot of inside information. You know, yeah. they see every search on Earth. Uh, yeah. that's good. There's good data there. Good data there, Ed. You know, yeah. they see things. Yeah. Like, the economists probably would love, they'd probably be a pretty fun job as, as, as an economist. Of that one in particular. Yeah. 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 But, but, I, but, but back to the Fed. Yeah. yeah look, they, they're, they, they, look, they, they spend a lot of time creating their models. They're trying to follow like everybody else. And, you know, sometimes they're going to be right. They're probably more right than we give them credit for. But because when they're wrong, they're really wrong. And, you know, the economy goes well, in the, like in any, the like anything else Ed. right at extremes that's when we want to pay more attention usually they're just meddling around yeah yeah and then and then greenspan goes out in in 06 and says ah, you know i think the housing market's in good shape eh, not <laughs> yeah. so much yeah he, he had a good uh, run he had a good run greenspan yeah, yeah greenspan the housing market's in good shape then the etf companies are like "Ooh, let's launch some home building etfs that's a great idea right remember that good time. <laughs> yeah yeah there you go. Um, it was it, it was a good idea at the time. Uh, listen, if they <laughs> usually Wall Street's making the money and the uh, the bag holders are the ones that get hurt. Seems like those ETF companies did pretty well on that, so good for them. Uh, Ed, you know what I've noticed is that I've noticed over the last couple of months as we've gotten new all time highs in some of these indexes, um, the percentage of stocks going up uh, has declined. Now I want to caveat that. And I want to hear your thoughts. In December, we had all these breath thrusts. Everybody had a thrust. You had the Clissold thrust. You had the Wiley thrust, the Zweig thrust. Everybody gets a thrust, right? So if essentially all the stocks are going up, then mathematically you can't have more stocks going up, right? It can, it can only be less from there. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's bearish, right? But I want to hear your thoughts. Percentage of stocks above their 200-day. I know you brought that chart. Percentage of stocks above their 50-day, you know, new 52-week highs, et cetera, et cetera. You know, any thoughts on 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 all of that? Where my head is at? Yeah, well, yeah. So we we had yeah great great numbers uh, from that you know late October through through late December rally, and uh, yeah, it, you know, you can't get above one hundred percent. We got pretty close on some on some measures, yeah. and and so yeah, the market's taken you know it, it, on a on a breath basis. It, it it took a little bit of a of a step back. Uh, particularly you saw you know, like, look, you know, like small caps, you, you know, really pulled back yeah. at the beginning of the year. Uh, but 
what we didn't see was a widespread breakdown in anything in those prep. Yeah. So in a, in a way it's kind of like kind of healthy underneath the surface, even though the popular average is kind of, kind of chugged along, you know, made, made some, made some new highs uh, under the surface. Maybe you did get a little bit of that, of that we call it a healthy, healthy correction or healthy pipe corrections, even too strong, healthy pullback uh, to, to maybe, maybe, you know, relieve some of the overbought uh, conditions. You know, the way I think about it too, is it, it, when you get a, some the market tops happen all all sorts of ways, but rarely do they do, do market tops in, in indices occur in conjunction with 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 peaks in in market breadth. Usually, it, it's you get you get a new high, you get a pullback, and then the rally, the breadth doesn't quite confirm. You go through that a few times, and then that then the popular averages roll over in both directions. Then, you see that bottoms too, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, it's probably sometimes it's even cleaner on the on the on the bottoms, yeah. but uh, but. We, we kind of hit a reset on the on that clock in December where uh, you know a lot of those breath measures did make new highs uh, compared to what they had done you know earlier on in the bull market that started at the end of 22. yeah so it kind of like okay we can we can we can handle a few divergences probably have some time to see what it looks like and you know I, now I was getting some broadening again last last week. have yeah. you ever have you ever seen a case where the, where the indexes did roll over before breath? Um, you know, I have top of my head. I do not remember a case. I, I bet if you go back, I bet we could find one. Uh, I bet we could find we could, one too, but it's tough. Yeah. I'm with that on this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, I mean, you get these, you can get a blow off top, which will maybe at the end, like it, you, what you'd get would be, okay. It's a narrow market. Then you finally get the last, like call it like a three, four weeks blow off and everything goes up. So maybe like short term breath looks really good, but the long term breath doesn't, and that would be, you know, that would be more 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 concerning. Yeah, usually you've got yeah. some big divergences before those tops and stuff like that. You know, I mean, they yeah. but they they can diverge for a long time. Like you know, back in the dot com bu bubble, transports had been rolling over for like over a year already. Yeah, yeah, like the the NYC AD line peaked in April of '98. I mean, almost two years. So that, that yeah, so so you don't want to you don't want to turn bearish just because of a couple of divergences. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, um, I think Jeff Jeff DeGraff uh, made a comment um, one time about like two thirds of divergences resolve to the upside. Ha <laughs> ha! Nice. So you pay attention to. It, I was like, oh, that's a good stat. Um, Trying to trying to recreate it myself. I don't know if it's an exact percentage, but it doesn't matter. But but yeah, so a lot of these things tend to work out. Uh, but but I tell you the other thing that that um, the soapbox that I, I I like to get on is you know when people say oh the is only you know the mag seven is 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 responsible for you know whatever you know two thirds of the gains in the market and this that and the other. Well, yeah, they're big stocks. They're going up. That, that that's okay. The problem is if the other ones weren't going right. up. So it's kind of this absolute versus relative yes. on it. If they're going down, problem. If if they're going up but going up less, okay. Well, and that tells I, me where that, I should focus. That's so good that you just said that because, yeah, there's nothing wrong with the best players scoring a lot of your points, right? LeBron just had 40,000 yeah. points. Shout out, LeBron James. Um, you know, the, it's what you said. It's if, if the other ones are going down. So, like, last year, they're like, oh, the MAG-7 represents, like, X percent of the S&P's return. But to your point, Cruise lines were doing great. Industrial stocks were doing great. You know, discretionary stocks were doing great. Like, it wasn't just those seven. But that's a great point. If the other ones are falling and those are the only ones going up, then that's a problem. But that was never happening ever at all last year. No. No, it's kind of like the, the drive-by technical analyst, you know, who looks at a couple stats and, you know. <laughs> the drive-by uh, yeah. technical analyst. <laughs> Love that. Yeah. Love that. That's a good one. Well, it's like me trying to go in and trying to, you know, dig into a balance sheet of a company. Like, hey, that needs to happen. Somebody needs to do it, but that ain't me. That ain't right, so, right, right. That, know, good go, go good thing, it. too. That's, that doesn't sound like any fun at all. Um, what about <laughs> okay. what about the bellwethers? Any thoughts on Apple making new relative lows every day? You know, making new four-month lows on Friday? You know, stock markets at all-time highs, and, and you got a bellwether like Apple. So... I'm old enough to remember when Apple was a big deal. It was it was the biggest deal of them all, in fact. And I feel like that was just a few months ago. You know, now now that Apple's falling apart every day, is it is it just convenient that it doesn't matter anymore, or do you actually think it does? Any any thoughts there on the bellwethers? Um, yeah, well, no, I mean, it's it's very relevant. 
you know, second biggest stock, uh, I believe right now. And so it's, uh, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's challenges is, is top line growth from what I can, I, I can see. Um, now it's a, it's a cash making m machine and, you know, they, they do a great job of, of managing the cash and, and, and optimizing it. But, uh, but yeah, you know, there's going to be other ones that are, they're going to, they're going to take the mantle. So, and that's the one of the other challenge I have with, with the, you say mag seven, like, like it was, it wasn't, it was Fang and Apple wasn't even part of Fang. That's right. It was Facebook. Amazon, Netflix, Google, then it was fan mag, you <laughs> know, mag. Had Microsoft and Apple in, and then it became mag seven and Netflix suddenly disappeared. Uh, and you know, we replaced it with NVIDIA and it's like, well, again, we kind of list this survivorship bias. And so we're going to open another one when, when we take out Apple. Uh, so that's, that's my, my struggle with, with that sort of stuff. But, um, but, but yeah, I, you'd, you'd like for it to, to not be, not be struggling the way it is, but it, it is still as, as important as it is, it's just one stock. So yeah, maybe this is part of a broad, I'm sure you guys have seen, you know, the, the Russell 2000 made almost a, a two year high. I wouldn't call it a breakout. Chad's Chat, talking about bit. that. Yeah. What yeah. about, what about uh, okay. mid caps? I know, I know mid caps hold a special place in your heart, Ed. I know they yeah. do. Uh, can you share that stat? Cause I, I try to quote you sometimes on that stat. And I think I screw it up every time. What is the, uh... yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's the, it's a forgotten sub asset class. Right. Where, um, uh, you know, everybody, there's actually more money going into small cap ETFs and small cap just mutual funds than, than, than mid caps. But if you look over the long run, um, which of the three, if you, you can use this with Russell or, or S&P uh, indices, which is the best in a given year, uh, the, the large cap, mid cap or small cap indices? It's roughly one third, one third, one third. Small caps get a going back more how far to the 70s? Uh, yeah, Russell, Russell back to the 70s, S&P goes back to the 80s. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then if you look at but if you look at which one's the worst. Small caps have only been the worst, like four to four years Mid -caps, out of I mean. all that. I'm, I'm sorry. See, thank you. Now, you asked me to tell you the science stat and mess it up. Mid caps <laughs> only the worst four times because, in, you know, a lot of times when, when there's high beta working, small caps do great. Mid caps kind of benefit from that. But then when things get terrible, people want to get defensive, they go into large caps, but mid caps are li liquid enough and they, 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 they don't, I mean, their businesses are stable enough. They don't go down as much as small caps. And as we all know, the, you know, the, the first rule of making money is not to lose money. And so mid caps outperform large caps and small caps over the long run. Mostly because they rarely are are the biggest rel relatively. So they really are the forgotten middle child because they may not always be the best, but they definitely aren't the worst. So, and, and I gotta right. tell you, I got I gotta tell you, when you talk to as many people as I do, and Ed, I know you talk to a lot of people as well. You talk to a lot of these old timers, and they'll tell you some of the biggest winners of their entire careers have come from mid caps on an individual stock level. I'm saying. Right, they come from yeah. mid caps. I've heard this a zillion times. Yeah, yeah. So these, you know, they've gotten big enough where they can really take economies of scale, but they haven't gotten. Because even when you talk about Apple, I, look, great company, but what, what are they going to do? Become the entire world economy? I mean, at some point, they they do they do have the the curse of la of large numbers, and mid caps don't you know generally don't have that. And then the other aspect is that okay, we. 25 years ago, there were like 8,000 publicly traded companies in the U.S. Now we're a little over half that. Well, So if you say, look at the Russell 3,000. Okay. Well, so 25 years ago, okay, the 3,000 stock was, you know, in the, in the top third of all publicly traded companies. It's still a pretty legit company. Now, you know, the, the, bot, the bottom half of the Russell is, is a bunch of junk, really. And that's why you see these stats, you know, 40, 50 percent of, of Russell 2000 companies are unprofitable. It, it's it's a con index construction problem as much as it is a, a you know, a problem with 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 small with a, with a with small doesn't does it, does it, doesn't the Wilshire 5000 only have like thirty five hundred companies? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever came up with that name, they're, they're regretting it. Whoever, I mean, yeah. it was a long time ago. But that I was... think I think the Wilshire Five Thousand has never had five thousand companies. I think it was like slightly below that from the start, and it's just been declining ever since, which is hysterical. Um, yeah. How about how about seasonality? And I know you guys do over at Ned Davis. You guys do fantastic work, by the way. I just want to give you guys a shout out. Um, always have huge inspiration to me. That conversation between Ned Davis and Jeff DeGraff. That podcast that they did together a couple of years yeah. ago—it wasn't that yeah. long ago. Oh, 
It's just so awesome. Those are two of my favorites of all time. So, so awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, they're, they're great. And I tell you, Ned, Ned is um, just a fantastic guy. And, and he is like, we, we joke about what's in Ned's head uh, because, you know, he, you talk to him and he will pull out a stat like, like this happened in 1962 and, the, and this happened, the market went up 4.8%. Yeah. I'm like, you are incredible, man. Uh, but, He's got a couple uh, more years on us, Ed. Yeah, I try, I try to remind him when he does that. I say, I say, oh, so what? 1962. What were you doing then? Yeah, I wasn't quite around yet. Yeah, right. But right, um, right, yeah, right. he he chuckles, but I don't think he really means it. But anyway, he's a legend, uh, man, legend. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, but uh, but yeah. So um, then seasonality. Yeah. Um, so a cu- couple things. One is yeah, we're kind of entering a little bit of a weak seasonal period for the for the market. Uh, but, um, uh, but, um, but if you focus on just election years, oh, okay. Yeah. You guys got this up here. Focus on, on just election years. Um, you, uh, you can see the first half of election years tends to be weak. So what we're showing here, this is the Dow, but we use the Dow because it goes back 1900 daily versus 1928 for the S and P get a few more cycles. The trend's the same if you use the S and P, but so the first half of election years tend to be kind of weak, uh, and then um, and then you get a rally later on in the year. But the timing of that rally often depends on when it becomes clear who the winner is going to be. Uh, and you know the market can go up under Democrats or Republicans, but if you kind of know the rules of engagement, then the, the market can kind of kind of move on. Um, so I do wonder if this is kind of going to overhang the market for a while this year because it's probably going to be a close election, you know, to. To uh, two people, nobody seems to want to have run running. But um, but then what we're doing on this chart is we divide it up into who wins in November. Of course, so you don't know at the time, right? Is is it who's going to win in November? But when the incumbent wins, the market tends to do better. When the incumbent loses, well, okay, there's a chicken and egg argument here. Economy is doing well. That's going to help the stock market do well, and that's going to help the incumbent party win probably. But um, it's not quite as exaggerated under Democrats. So the blue lines there are, are the solid blue is incumbent Democratic Party wins, dash blue is incumbent Democratic Party loses. That's because you know, if you think about some of the Republican cases, you get some real extremes like, like 08, 19, 1932, uh, it, where you, know, you had uh, the, the market really struggling. And then on the other side, you got some boom, boom times as well. So, uh, so, so Ed, yeah. When it, comes to, when it comes to the incumbent losing like this, is it more because of the market uncertainty, right? Like, like if, if the guy that's been in here for four years, if he wins, like we, we kind of know what we're going to get. It's not like this, like unknown, but like if the other guy wins, the Republican guy wins and he was already president and we know what we're going to get. Is there less of an unknown, right? You feel me? Yeah. So I think there's two things. There's, there's a, there's a kind of fundamental macro component of the economy doing well. And then, yeah, there's a sentiment. To, absolutely. There's a sentiment aspect to this where the, uh, the unknown. And then so you say, well, what does that mean now? Because we, we don't have to look back that far. Right. So we know what Trump... You know, we know both of them. Like, we know what we get with both of them, right? Yeah. 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 You, you have to go all the way back to um, well, you know, 1892, I think, when uh, when it was uh, Harrison and, and uh, Garfield, I think, was they, they went, they, they went, they actually went back to back and they flipped uh, presidents. Uh, the last time you actually had somebody run who had lost the general election was nixon in 68 and that was really in 1960 the the, the um, primary system wasn't really what it was now it was like you had to go out and win every state you've still kind of decided you know, smoke filled back rooms at conventions so trump really has already made history by getting the, uh, the party nomination three times in a, in a row uh and uh in the modern po- uh, primary system but but yeah so it, it is it is an interesting thought uh to see we, we kind of know the playbook, although I would argue that there are different industries that that would clearly benefit from from one or the other. Tax policy very different. You know, Biden has not seen a spending bill he didn't like. Trump was all about you know trying to trying to cut taxes. He's talked about you know cutting taxes more. Uh, but one of our, our favorite we did a we did a big report a couple of weeks ago on this. One of our favorite ones is looking at green energy. <laughs> And this is the ultimate sentiment play. Green energy did awesome in 2020. And then once Biden got in the office, like it just got, got. And the coal stock started ripping. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, who would have thought that, you know, telling the world that uh, we're not going to um, drill any more oil would, would mean that it would become scarce and people would want it. Yeah. Crazy. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ed, any, any, any final thoughts before the fun police comes in and, and boots you out? A any final thoughts on this market? You know, you want to talk a little bit about rates, precious metals, Bitcoin, anything on your mind that we didn't bring up? Um, well, I think the, 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 what, one thing we haven't gotten, gotten into is that, you know, you the growth stocks, large cap growth, and we're on top of the max seven. And if you look at the Russell 2000 growth versus 2000 value, that chart looks really nice. Yeah. And so if you're thinking, oh, I want to get some growth stocks, okay, there's opportunities outside, you know, outside of the, the mega caps um, where, where maybe you can, you can play. So mid cap and, and, and small cap growth, that'd be an interesting place to look at. New, new two year highs uh, uh, on Friday for small cap growth versus small cap value. Exactly. Yeah. So Russell 2000 growth versus Russell 2000 value, new two year highs on Friday. Yeah. There you go. There Interesting look. Interesting look. Thank you so much, Ed Clissold, Ned Davis Research. Thanks guys a lot. Great Ed. work. Keep it up. Great stuff. Uh, hey, thanks for having me on. Really enjoyed it, guys. You guys you do great it. stuff. Always fun. He's the man, dude. He's the man. Yeah, that was great. Always, um, always, always coming in, coming in hot with fun facts. You yeah, know, well, a historian. Yeah. Well, you you mentioned you mentioned the mid cap stat from him like a couple weeks back, and that's what rem reminded me. Oh, I should get Ed back on the show, right? So, um. Always great to have it on. Uh, okay. That was uh, an excellent interview. Also, while I was out, I tuned in for a few interviews. I thought, you know, as much of a bastard as he could be, it took us, what, like six months to get him on the show. The interview with our friend Dan Russo was fantastic uh, last week. It was great. That's yeah, nice good. Job, guys. Yep. Yeah. Love Dan. Um, okay. You guys, you know how you guys are always looking for, like, the stock or the ETF that will give you the most juice for your squeeze, right? Don't talk, I about, don't talk to me about these levered vehicles. No, 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 no. Forget that. I have a new stock for you guys. It's going to be the juiciest. This this should give you the most beta in theory. Tell, tell me. Give you the it. most beta. It's a we have a brand new crypto mining stock that is, that just completed a SPAC merger today. Wait. And the ticker. So, so okay. So to recap, you've got Wait. crypto crypto mm -hmm. mining. You've got SPAC, and the ticker is fufu. F u f u. What's not to love about this thing? <laughs> Bitfufu Bit is the name of the company. Uh, it's cloud mining. I don't even know what that means. It's got, <laughs> it's got cloud in it. So, okay. Oh, uh, crypto mining. Cloud. Yep. Back. <laughs> Fufu. <laughs> What's yep. not to love here? I have thought. It's up, thought, a, lot, it's up right? 100% today. <laughs> so, if a company comes out in the middle of what is becoming like a craze for these crypto equities right now, right? Everyone knows about them. It's not a secret. These were the best performing stocks along with Coinbase uh, in the entire oh, And it's Chinese. Thank you, GRV. Yes. yes. What's not to right. love? So this one checks way too many um, cautionary boxes, right? This one doesn't have one red flag. It's got like five red flags plus a market cap of like 30 million. This is the stuff you start to see. We're, we're middle innings here, right? And you're yeah. going to see so much more of this as we get into six, seven, eight, ninth inning, right? Yeah. This is just the beginning. There's going to be more. There's going to be crazy ICOs. Every stadium or arena in America is going to be named after a new freaking crypto token like we saw in 2019, 2020. This is starting to happen. Um, and what we have, right, as investors is a playbook of what works, what worked during the last cycle, what continues to work during this cycle, we have what I would call trusted equity market vehicles, whether it's MicroStrategy, Coinbase, your Mara, uh, Riot, and Riot even don't love, right? But the crypto miners who are operating well, doing the right thing, uh, the leaders, right? Stick to them. I would stay away from any of the new funky stuff. This is Are funny. you saying a ticker that's called Fufu is not to be trusted? I'm saying we're lucky now because we have a playbook. We have the vehicles. We keep going back to them and using them. They work great. I don't think we need the foo foo, is all I'm saying. And I expect five to ten more foo foos before this cycle is all said and done. This I'm is here just for all the foo. I'm here for all hard. the foo foos. You know, Michael Santoli, <clears throat> shout out. I used to love reading Mike uh, in Barons. In Barons? I used to read him in Barons yeah. too. I was very young reading Mike in Barons. Now I get to see him on the TV almost every day. Um, he came on this baseball morning. player. Is he? Nice. Here's the point you made this morning. I want to know what you think about it. Both of you. 
he said we're we're no longer in the um what what do you say disbelief phase right we're in the acceptance phase of the bull market right where the bears are capitulating saying fine people are buying and you see that incremental demand you literally see it on the charts right it's like a relentless bid in markets and he said like you never know how long this phase kind of plays out before you hit euphoria but we're officially in the phase before euphoria what do you think yeah. and and we're going to hear so much about the cycle and where are we is it early is it late is it mid like this is these are the conversations we're going to be having more of i think over the coming i quarter. think it i think it depends on the time horizon right time. like yeah. when you zoom out um and you look at these giant bases especially the fab 5 that we've been talking about industrials new york stock exchange broker dealers semis um technology and what's the fifth one Homies? and home builders yeah. right if those five groups are above the former highs from late 21 early 22 and i include technology and semis because they're they're different right technology is apple and microsoft semis are semis so I, I like to include both i think both of them are really important um if we're above those highs like from any kind of longer term perspective it's hard to be too pessimistic and and i would agree with that perspective that the market is in the acceptance phase on a more short-term time horizon um i would argue maybe a little bit more euphoric that's how i see that would you agree with that yeah i think so yep um me and straza agree so much spencer spencer doesn't like it so you could trade the waves right but when you zoom out and think about the primary trend like the 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 overarching cycle that we're in we're fine right you don't want to overthink it yeah uh the, the late great john borman uh. said during bull markets just shut up and enjoy it <laughs> what are the things you'll look for what is the kind of stuff you'll be seeing when you say okay we're hit we're hitting euphoria is it just correlations is there no, more it's, it's it's jc's friends and neighbors and uncles and their friends neighbors kids he doesn't school, share the school. data though. He keeps it very close. I don't share yeah. the data. I share the data with you guys. Yeah. Okay. I don't tell them. Like, You're I, don't, I weird can't about tell it. my father what a Dude. great contrarian indicator he is. Um that's a secret Steve. indicator. Steve. Like Steve. Strauss's dad's not a contrarian indicator. Strauss's yeah. dad's on point. Steve, yeah. you, my you dad know it. You know indicator. it when you see it. I, I don't that's I don't cool. know what euphoria is, but you know it when you see it. You know it when you right? see it. We know it when we see it. That's it. You want you want to know some information I'm I'm getting from Papa Strauss lately? Big Please. big shot over here sending me screenshots of his dividend account this weekend. <laughs> look how look how well I'm doing. <laughs> I'm sure he's doing, sure he's doing well. Uh, yeah, but no no data there, no information for us. No, because yeah. Stras's dad Stras's dad's an investor and a trader and stock market stuff and from Connecticut. Yeah. My we didn't talk about the market at the dinner table. So when my father's texting me about the Chinese stock market, like yeah. that's information. You know, yeah. we could get my dad on uh, this month might be good. We had him on a spaces once. Remember, we could get him on to talk taxes. That might be really timely. Oh, Stras's dad's way cooler than than Steve. That's fair. Most of my friends think that. All right. What uh, else we have to talk about? Yeah. yeah. We want to talk about gold. A couple, couple headlines we'll and then and then gold. Well, that's that's we'll save gold for, for we have Ian Cully coming on like five minutes. So let's save the gold for Ian. A um, couple headlines. Uh, Macy's uh, re received a revised higher bid by a consortium of private equity. So it's one twenty four dollars a share in cash. That's the new Wait. offer on the table for Macy's. Macy's is actually finding a buyer. They had a buyer and they said, no, too low. And and the buyer said, okay, we'll come up. So I think it was 21 originally. Now it's 24. Uh, well, this was last week. Uh, Boeing proposed a takeover of um, uh what is it? Spirit Aero Systems or SPR is the ticker? The, the their their main supplier of parts, right? The, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the John Oliver episode this weekend was all about Boeing. I thought it was excellent. Oh, I usually watch him on like a. When five, is that show on Sunday day, nights? Right? Is that yeah. Sunday nights? Yeah, I watched yeah. it last night. Yeah. Did you did you watch the one about about pig butchering? Yeah. Okay, I sent that to like everyone that I know. Yeah, I mean. I, he I sent this to my parents. I told my wife, I was like, send this to your parents, send this to your family, send this to your cousin, to everybody. Like, that was last Because I am so paranoid about someone I know getting so, scammed. 
So pig butchering is, is that just a phrase for just crypto scams? No, it's, okay. it's, it's the, it's the idea of just like fattening. So it's not a crypto scam per se. It's just fattening you up and then not like scamming you in two seconds, scamming you over the course of like two months. Right. These yeah. scammers are so savvy. Honestly, you, everyone likes to yeah. think it couldn't happen to them. It, That's what I've been saying. What was it? The CEO of what? Yeah, there's a, a bank Greenland in Kansas. Bank? Yeah. Dude, that's embarrassing. But it it's so real. It's a problem. And they're getting better and better. And they're gonna leverage AI and all this shit. They're gonna they're gonna they'll be yeah. they'll be coming hard. So it scares, the, it scares the crap out of me. Cybersecurity. Shout out. Cybersecurity. Blockchain. Blockchain. Shout out blockchain. <clears throat> yep. Okay. Um couple more headlines. Uh OPEC extended, sorry, OPEC plus, excuse me, extended their cuts through the end of June. This was not a surprise, but nonetheless, uh, if you care about the price of oil. You know what question I'm waking up asking myself this morning, guys? Earlier yeah. this year, I was asking myself, do I own enough financials? I really don't think I own enough financials. Today, I woke up, and last week, I felt it. The, the feeling was like creeping into me. Today, I'm waking up and asking myself, do I really own enough energy? Like, do I yeah. have the enough answer, oil the, and the, gas? Answer, the answer is no, you don't. Right? You with me? Yeah, I've been telling you, S&P is the denominator. S&P is the denominator in, in a lot of ratios. I'm in. And guess what? The charts continue to look better and better and better uh, under the surface with an energy. We're finding just breakouts left and right. They also, there are other patterns, not the breakout patterns, but the scoop and score the off scoop lower bounds. Yep. They're, they're different. They're both good. I think we should own both C of them. limited was that, Streza? It scooped so hard. Uh I'm ready to talk Stupid about so hard. A couple more. Wait, one last thing. Friday, we got a, a, a little alert from uh, Standards and Poor's. Can you can bring up Ugh. slide eight, please? Super microcomputer, welcome to the SP 500. Skip you're mid caps in. altogether. Yeah, you're in. Decker's Outdoor, you're in. Uh, Whirlpool, you're gone. Zion Bancorp, you're gone. Dude, Zion Bancorp, is that even still around? Clearly. I, yeah. I mean, obviously. Zion is one of those big energy banks. Really? Uh, uh, I think that gets accused of having like too much energy exposure. Uh, you heard of these? Oh, isn't that what we're looking for? Right now, like, like Colin Frost. So this is interesting. Um, also, from this news, did you see this? The, I guess the sympathy sell-off. The sympathy no? sell-off. Palantir, Palantir just got stiffed hard. So you know how everybody knew Uber was going to be added before Uber was actually added? Yeah. And then Uber got added. But everybody really knew it was coming. We were talking about it like weeks, months before. Hey, Uber's going to get added. With this one, with this time around, it was Palantir. Palantir's going to get added. Everybody knows, knows Palantir's going to get added. And Super Micro just swooped right in. Uh, what? It's been the last three quarters of results that really put them in. So Palantir sold off a bit because they didn't get put in. But here's what this means. If you're a Palantir investor, like I'm sitting here, I own, I own plenty of Palantir. They're just going to get in next time. That's great. You know, it's not it's not a bad thing. Sure. They got skipped over because Super Micro's been on a ridiculous run. I don't think you could, you know, get too mad about that. But it's coming for Palantir. So. All right. I did not know. Do they that. have a schedule with when they do that or do they just do it when they feel like it? I honestly don't They know. probably have a schedule, I would imagine. Uh, this Can, you is, is this Can you throw that back up? Can you throw that back up, Spencer? What, Are those all the moves that they've made? Wasn't the last yeah. one right at the end of the year though? Like I would think quarterly, but this has been I think JC, Uber was different added. different in, different indexes. So we only really care about the the the, the top four rows here. Because. You might only care about the top four rows. I'm interested in. Um, I guess really? I guess I'm not that interested. Really, in the you're interested one. in the small cap 600? Well, no, the S and P 100. I would say I'm interested in the S and P 100 though. No, the mids are interesting. Eh, it's a lot of them though. I want to know about the mids that get added from the smalls, though, not the mids that get added from the large, right? I'm interested in the ones that skip the mids altogether. <laughs> so it looks like cytokinetics just move from small to mids. Where's this Where's this from? The Standard & Poor's website? Mm -hmm. Who AIT owns Standard & Poor's? Also. SP Global? SPGI? Uh, yeah, yeah, who owns? No, hey, Standard, Standard & Poor's what? is... What SPGI, else? right? Yeah. SP Global. Yeah. yeah. No, no. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah you're right. You're it's right, not right. Dow Jones, which is owned by no, News Corp. No. Yeah. You're right. You're right. You're right. Right. Okay, guys. This happens every three months. This happens every three months. Uh, so the Uber announcement was December fourth. 
And here we are, March 4th. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. that makes no, sense. That, that makes sense. Quarterly. That makes sense. All right. Quarterly it is. All right. See? There we go. T- today we all learned. Uh, we Steve, all learned did wa- something. Did you want to do a hot corner before bringing bring Enoch? Please. Well, all right. I mean, we, there was one that was... All right, fine. Hot so hot right now. Anything good, Straza? Good. Uh, look at this one oak. This is exactly what we're just talking about, how we continue to see more and more just bullish chart patterns setting up in the uh, oil and gas space. This one is a midstream operator. Not an MLP, though, so that's cool. OKE, about a 5% yield. Not the biggest buy, but this one's been on our list before. Can we throw up the chart? Do we have the chart? I don't know if we do. Um, we have the chart. No? Okay. No chart. Uh, so one oak looks great. And the other theme here is biotech. We can oh, see I'll, throw the, I'll throw the oak. I thought we had it. I, I have it. I, I'm loving everyone's favorite garage band uh, lead singer, James Dolan, buying some some sphere. Again. Yeah, we're going to do that one next. So the biotech stand out for sure. Oh, that's my two, Spencer. And then throw up sphere. I got two. There's I know we oak. have the sphere charts. There you There's go. There's that oak. This Look at that. Great. This is great. Uh, very actionable. Just about to break out here. 5% yield. A lot to like. There's a lot of good charts with uh, very high, well above average yields in energy that are breaking 5.2% out. 5.2% yield, by the way, here in the one oak. Continue to say that. Yes. Uh, MLPs, right, have these huge, juicy yields. And they've really been the leaders, them and the refiners. I, The bet that I'm going to make, though, I was doing some overlay charts yesterday. The refiners and the midstream stuff tend to outperform during bear markets or corrections for energy. The outperformers during bull markets for energies or rally phases for energy are explorers and producers and the services. And I think if we're finally going to break out of these ranges, you're going to see leadership shift back to the more risk on groups, to the EMPs and the services. We haven't seen it yet. I think we get there. So it's just something to like kind of keep in the back of our minds. I don't think you want to load into the old leaders, the MLPs and the refiners. I think you want to keep an open mind to new leadership emerging. Steve, is that because the yields are lower on those, on the services? Probably, the, right? Yeah, they're just the more offensive groups, right? Like the yeah. refiners uh, and the MLPs, they're just moving the oil and selling it, right? The guy's actually taking it out of the ground and building the rigs and stuff to help take it out of the ground. They're the risk on groups where bull market for energy – uh, demand uh, improving for energy, those guys are going to be doing a lot of business and they're going to recognize better results faster than the more risk off groups. Okay. Um, yeah. I, this is, I got, I have a theory here. I have a theory. Yeah. Throw up this, throw up the sphere. So uh, El Duterino bought how much? Three million. Uh, yeah. This is uh, James Dolan. That's the guy. This is the son, Straza, because I, I I graduated from the Charles Dolan School of Business. Yeah, this is a guy. No, Let's but this is, this is his son, right? Listen, this is yes. not one. Hold on, you're I not answering know. the question. Yes, this is, this this is, is his guy, son, right? This is his son. Yes. This son, this son. Uh, so, I, I'm not super bullish. This Can I is tell you a, my theory? What? What about it? My theory is that this stock has been going down uh, for years. Right. Uh, yeah. Since 2021, since the peak in March of 2021, when all the SPACs peaked, by the way. Now yeah. the, the U2 concerts are pretty freaking sick and the fish yeah. concerts and everyone's like, oh, my God, this is so dope. Is he like, huh, maybe I should buy some more. Like, is is the fact that it's so awesome. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, everybody knows how awesome it is. I haven't been, unfortunately. Uh, I got too many kids. But all my friends that have been and I have too many friends that have been. Wait. Yeah, wait, 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 what is this chart you're looking at? The- yeah, we have some friends who just have way too much fun in Vegas. Um, and this sphere thing that they keep telling yeah, us, what about. is your what is your problem with this chart? Sphere's only been around for like a year, that's not true. No, it's been around for was, was it a murder of some, of some kind? Uh, I think it was Spack Daddy. No, I think it was Spack Daddy, wasn't it? Oh. It's been around, it's oh, been, yeah, I, it was a but it was what? around while they were building. Mm-hmm. 
Really? It was, it was around while they were building. It was a post-COVID situation, so maybe, you know, I don't know. Oh, I mean, well, like, that that huge gap there from last year, that that's all the price history that I have is going back to that, the start at the bottom of that. So um, I have uh, I have price history going back way before that to 2020. Okay. All right. I don't know. Whatever. No, I, I, I thought this was it a, wasn't a spag daddy. I don't know if it was. It, it would look like a spec and that looks nothing like a spec. Um, it so, does when you take it back further. OK, I don't know. I don't know. Well, it looked like something did happen in Q3, Q4 of 2023. I think this might have been. I have. It takes it back to 2020. I, this might have been a different company. I don't I know. I don't think that's right. Yeah, I don't think. Uh, this This is right, right here. This chart is right. Well, it's, either way, either way, this is probably this is probably the most bullish way to look at it anyway. Uh, this company is really struggling to make money. I, I don't really get... Like I've never looked into it I, just from a high level. The, I know, but it's so sick, though. Have you seen these videos from inside the sphere? It's ridiculous, man. It's like classic hype. And stuff. have you spoken to anybody who's been? Obviously, you have. And they all say incredible things. Kenny and Joe Fami won't stop talking about and it. And Josh Brown. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah. Listen, it looks sick. It looks so awesome. It looks uh, so cool. And from the hotels, like overlooking the Vegas Strip and seeing that big sphere is pretty cool, too. So when you... Whenever you buy something, buy an asset, buy a stock, like the question you should be asking yourself right before you hit the buy button is, is there anything better that, you know, I can use this capital on? Yeah. And I just, it's a hard one for me to say this sick concert venue is literally just a building that sells is tickets it because, to concerts. Is it because you're a, a Knicks fan? Party city. I know. What? Is it because you're a Knicks fan and this guy keeps screwing everything up? He, well, and that's the other thing. The management here is like this is a management team that has has proven to us over and over proven and over, losers. over again that yeah. they can't do anything right ever. Whether it's cable, the Knicks, anything they touch is up. Dude, they brought in Penny Hardaway at the end of his career. You know, like let's be let's be serious. I mean, this you did that so much. I don't even want. I don't even want to. So we can make a laundry list of. We guys can make a laundry list of veter oh. veterans brought in at the end. I got of their twenty five career. years of grievances. How much time do you have? <laughs> I mean, we, yeah, we can go all that. But the problem is I have to ask myself before I hit the buy button on something like this, would I, would you rather own this or like a software stock, you know, or like a really good business? Is it's, it really fair to compare the sphere to a software stocks strategy? I would compare anything I could buy to the best things I could buy whenever I'm buying. And they gotta be that good. Like Straz is comparing like sphere to like Israeli software. Like, oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't think that's a fair comparison. It's two different animals, two different animals. Why don't we bring in Ian and talk a little bit about gold? Speaking of oh, different yeah, animals. you know, I love the, gold. The chat, chat's right. The sphere was like an, it was like an MSG spinoff. MSG spinoff. Anyway, yeah. Ian's here. Let's talk what the fic. Uh, Morning, Mr. guys. Cully, Mr. Collie minus the afro. Uh, That's right. Yep. Yeah. Um, did you donate it at least? No, it wasn't that long. It wasn't uh, long enough. It's pretty long, man. Um, uh, gold, new all-time weekly closing highs. Should we care? You got a weekly close, all-time weekly close? I was, I was shy 10 cents on my charts. Um, well, what do you... <laughs> I was shy 10 cents because that's what I. That's what the headline I wanted to use today. JC. Doesn't count. I didn't feel like I, I could use it. But well, you had an all-time weekly closing high on the GLD. Okay. That you definitely did. And then on the futures, I think you got it on the futures too. Why are you saying no? All right. Are we buying are we are we buying this crap again? We're gonna try this again. Well, you know, um I by mean, the way, we've been like that's an all time high closing on the futures too. What are you talking about, Ian? I don't know. I, I got I got I got uh what is it? You got seven. Regardless, it was very close to an all time high. Uh, an all time uh, weekly closing high. Yeah, it's close. It's right there. It's right there, and it's breaking above it today. So, um, okay. so do we want to buy gold in an environment where like cryptos are mooning? I don't know that one has anything to do with the other, Straza. Yeah, Again, opportunity costs. We I just talked about. I got to ask myself: Should I buy this shiny yellow rock that that never makes me any money? Never makes me it's sideways for. I know, Straza, years, sideways, but you but you weren't trading in the two thousands when gold was a ripper. Right, so this thing has sucked my entire career. Right, and there's fine. other yep. stuff that continues to do really, really well. And I know there are other people like me that can say the same thing watching this show. How do we convince people 
instead of buying the cryptos that are going up 100% overnight, go buy the shiny. Ball, we don't have to convince anyone. Put it under your bed, bury it in your backyard. What, what's the move? We don't have to convince anybody of anything. Right. Price, if you were an RIA or you were a person who wanted to convince people, make the bullish case for this over anything else. I love the fact that people are just being like, oh, you don't need to have precious metals as a sleeve in your portfolio anymore because now Bitcoin solves that. Love that too. Love, right. love that sentiment. Yeah. And that's, that's been a narrative for a while. I'll never forget Tom Lee's presentation. Was it 18, 2018, 19? At the CMT, do you remember what his thesis was? It wasn't just gold that's going to be replaced, but bonds too. He's like, you're not going to see treasuries and portfolios anymore. We got Bitcoin. But this has been a thing that people, very smart people have been saying for a very long time. Ian, with gold making new all-time highs, Newmont looks like shit, dude. It does. Yeah. It does. Wow. Yeah. Uh, there's, make the know. bullish case for me, Ian. JC won't do it. What bullish case is making new all-time highs? Oh. Aren't you the guy who loves buying new all-time highs? I mean, I like it when the relative trend is supportive too. Right. Well, I think the relative trend is going to catch up. Okay. You know, I think it's going to move down into the mining stocks. Because yeah, you look at the mining stocks, and especially uh, you know GDX relative to pretty much anything else. Yeah. GLD, uh, the broader uh, market SPY uh, looks terrible. Um, there's a handful of miners that you know are holding up and and look good, but yeah. I mean, a lot of them look like Newmont. I know a lot of them look like Newmont. So, I mean, there's an argument to be made that, you know, following the, the, the recent selling pressure over the past few weeks in some of these mining stocks that they're due for, you know, a nice mean reverting bounce. I mean, we'll see if we get it. I mean, if gold continues to break above 2100 and it starts to rip, then yeah, you got to imagine, you know, get a bid in, in, in the mining stocks. Ian, it's not even just Newmont. Like, if you look at any of the big guys, like Barrick, not good. Mm -hmm. It's ticker mm -hmm. symbol gold. I know we like to look at like Wheaton Precious. Wheaton looks terrible. It's got. I mean, yeah. So GDX, though, like you said about the miners, like I want to see those things moving, right? Then, then I could be convinced for sure. Maybe like some classic non-tops here, but JC always says like if it's not a top. Well, for it to be a top or a reversal formation, there's got to be something to reverse. And coming off what? Those October lows from 2022, there's really not much. There's not. How about this guy? How about this guy, Slide Chew? Spencer, throw it up. Look at Slide Chew here. How are we, how are we, how are we feeling about this guy here? We talk about, Straz is talking about relative strength. Higher high here. Um, and uh, momentum rolling over. Too cute or, or yes. something or something to think about? It's tight. It's tight, tight. right? Yeah. But yeah, this I is mean, real tight. this is like a week long divergence there. <laughs> tight. Ian, are there other things in the commodities complex you'd rather be buying than precious metals? Oil, energy, energy. Yeah. energy. How about ads? Anything else? Well, the softs are working. I think okay. it's, it's hard to to touch the grains right now. I mean, they're just starting to show signs of 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 not even bottoming. Just they're just they just stopped falling. Um, you know, maybe if you see uh, the cattle start to roll over and break down, then we'll see, you know, grains carve out a bottom. But the bonding process in the grains is, it's laborious. It takes time. So, you know, I don't really laborious. want to. Laborious. Yeah. Laborious. There's an SAT word. It's a good well, one. Hey, good I, one. Man, I, I, I was trying to buy grains in 2016. And I had to wait four years until they started to finally break out. So, uh yeah, it can be frustrating as well. Um, uh, hey, Ian, have you made enough money trading Coco yet? Is that trade over yet? The trade's not over. The trade's not over. Um, you know, it, it stalled right at a key extension level, um, around 6,600. This is a cryptocurrency, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, right? Yeah. I, this has been some move. It has. Um, and what's amazing, I'm just looking back at the chart now, right? You had this like multi-year base. Mm -hmm. uh, from what, like the 14, 15, 16 highs? October 2023, the optimal time to buy going into this year-end rally, which has really continued into this year, was October 23. This thing pulled back and gave like an almost perfect retest of those prior highs yeah. right at the October lows. The leadership was there, clear as day, right? Yeah. And then it blasted off. It's doubled since then. Love that. Um, can we please, uh, Spencer, can you throw up slide two? 
Because what I'm seeing is inflation protected treasuries here. Or Apple. We got to outperforming. Talk to well, I, I, I made this chart over the weekend. I just happened to have Apple in it. Forget the <laughs> Apple. Apple is making new lows every day. We know that. I'm talking more specifically to the top two charts. Uh, crude oil, making new three-month highs. Inflation-protected yep. treasuries, outperforming nominal yielding yep. treasuries. I don't think this is a coincidence that Apple's falling in this environment. Forget Apple. Mm -hmm. You know, the bond market is, you know, when you look at some of these... Uh, when. When you look at some of these polls and, and positioning, people are positioned for lower interest rates. People are positioned for lower inflation. But the bond market's telling us the exact opposite, Ian, isn't it? 100%. Yep. Energy. Those Energy. break evens never really rolled over. Um, rates, I mean, rates remain elevated. You know, the 10 years, you know, chopping around four and a quarter. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, everyone came into the beginning of the year. I'm gonna say everyone. The 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 Fed funds futures were were pricing in what six cuts, something crazy like that. Yeah, way too many. Yeah, it's, now um, it's three. It's now it's three. And you know what, mate? You know, if if gold breaks out and starts to run, and if you know biotechs keep ripping, you know, I <laughs> I gotta imagine maybe we don't get any cuts this year. I was just thinking that. Right? If it's just no cuts. Yeah. So look. So look at this. So this comes from the Bank of America Merrill Lynch Fund Manager Survey, which is always a good look. Um, in a dark blue, you have the percentage of fund managers expecting higher uh, inflation, and yeah. it's close to zero. And then in the light blue, you've got the fund managers percentage of fund managers expecting higher short-term rates. So basically none. So none of the managers uh, are expecting higher inflation. None of the managers are expecting uh, higher rates. Meanwhile. The bond market keeps making new highs yes, for in terms of pricing and inflation. Rates yeah. keep moving higher. The, so, yeah. So these are some of the, the greatest opportunities that markets give us, which is when everyone is expecting one thing, and then we look at the data, typically price, and it's telling us the opposite thing is yeah. happening. Because that offsides positioning, right, by the market's uh, participants – lends itself to explosive rallies and explosive moves in the opposite direction once they capitulate and, and admit that they're wrong. Because it's, it's not it's not fundamentals that drive prices, it's positioning. Yeah. And we've we talked about this coming into the year, how there was nothing more consensus about 2024 than these, this lower interest rate story. And we mm -hmm. talked about how, like, maybe not a black swan, but something that could really maybe shake the market or fool people which we should always be thinking of because the market is designed to fool the majority, would be inflation ticking back up and the Fed and the market having to totally pivot from we're getting all these cuts, it's great, to maybe no cuts, maybe another hike or two. Like, oh, that would really, that would be interesting. I don't know if stocks are really going up or uh, and enjoying that if and when it happens, but I don't know. I think it's, should be thinking about it though. Yeah, I don't know either. You know, I, but I think if gold breaks out and it holds it, its breakout. I mean, that will be the tell. I think that will be the tell for for uh, a period of reacceleration and in, in, like in inflation. Um, yeah. It kicked, it kicked everything. Such, it, gold has been such a shitty uh, inflation yeah. metric. No, no. And now all of a sudden we're going to look. It leads. It leads. So gold broke out from a yeah. big base in 2019. All right. Right. So, you know, everything was already in motion even before COVID hit in 2020. Let me, let me ask you, let me, let me ask you right? something, Ian. Let me ask you this. Yeah. When it comes to inflation, what do you trust more, the bond market or gold? Oh, the bond market. I rest my case. Yeah. The bond, but, 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 the, but gold plays a, a significant role in that it anticipates. Right? So maybe, think about it, like maybe. But we we know the bond market is making right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like that, you might be right, and I I kind of agree with you, but that's not even the point. Yeah. Like, just look at the bond market. No, can we? Yeah. Can we all agree there? Yeah. Because look, can we have a kumbaya moment where we all agree? <laughs> can we have a little kumbaya? Come on, guys. Come on, look kumbaya. All right. All that's right. a good place all to right. end the show for the day. Great actually. show today. Great show. All right. Excellent uh, job, JC. Great show today. This was great. <laughs> Strasa, we missed we missed you. Great, glad to have you back. Uh, we do have the flow show is back in action, eleven thirty Eastern time. Strasa and Sean making oh, yeah. an options trade, pretty much on the fly, uh, or at least trying to find one. And uh, that's what we got today. So thanks to our guest at Clistal. Thanks to all of you in the chat. Go make some money. Thanks, Ian. We'll see you later. Adios. See you guys. Okay. Money.
take no loss. Huh. I don't even know what it costs. Huh. I hit the ground and it go 